people consider this a controversial matter. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a controversial matter in the scripture. The only reason it's controversial is because people are living contrary to the scripture. Mm -hmm. No, it's a controversy when people don't do what God says. Right. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what the subject is, whether we're talking about the role of women, whether we're talking about marriage, divorce, remarriage, whether we're talking about instrumental music, whether we're talking about denominationalism, God's word is very clear on what it has to say about all of those topics. So there's no controversy there. Because God has already given us the truth. Amen. And so all we have to do is read the truth, study the truth, and follow the truth. And then there won't be no controversy. And so when we think about this topic, women's role in the church, you know, we think about what's going on in the Lord's church today. Now, as we go through this text, I'm not talking about what's going on in denominations. I'm not talking about what's going on in the world because they're not my concern. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, they're not our concern at all. Paul talked about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, why are we judging those on the outside? We know what they're going to do because they're not following God's word. Mm -hmm. But what about us on the inside? What about those of us who are in Christ? You see, it's a sad situation now because the same arguments that we have to use with denominational people we have to use with our own brother. Amen. And so when we talk about the roles of women in the local church, we've got to go to the scripture. Amen. We've got to go to the Bible and see what the Bible says. And so let's begin this, this afternoon in 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse number 8. You know, when we think about the roles of women, we need to understand that there is a role for women mm -hmm. in the Lord's church. And first, we cannot have the attitude that you can do whatever you want to do in the church. There is no way that God sent his son here to die on the cross, to shed his blood, and to suffer for you and I to become members of the church and do whatever we want to. Mm -hmm. God did not design it that way. The church is an organization where you and I are not just allowed to do whatever we want. Amen. You know, years ago when we were going up to Dayton, and the first class that we took was a hermeneutics class with Brother Melson. Mm -hmm. And that time we were going through the class, that's the first time I ever heard the word hermeneutics. Didn't even know what it was. <laughs> but as Brother Melson explained to us the interpretation of the scripture and how we're to take the word of God and use the word of God to exegete and bring out the meaning of passages, it has helped so much in our study mm -hmm. and in our growth. And one of the things that I wanted to make sure that I did with these passages of scripture for this lectureship, I didn't read anybody else's book. Mm -hmm. I didn't read any other articles. I just went to the scripture. Amen. Used my Greek text, did pretty much what Brother Melson did the other night, looked at the words, defined the words, see what God said about it, mm -hmm. and came up to the conclusion. Amen. But it should be that when you and I study the scriptures together, when we study with an open mind and with an open heart, we all should come to the same conclusion mm -hmm. on what the Bible says. Amen. And so as we look at this text, we want to realize that there is like a, a thesis of 1 Timothy. Mm -hmm. And the thesis is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul said there, but if I tarry long, that thou, that thou may know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, mm -hmm. which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so what is 1 Timothy all about? 1 Timothy is all about Christians learning how to behave themselves Amen. in the house of God. Amen. There is a way that you and I have to act as men. Mm -hmm. There is a way that you and I have to act as women. There is a way that elders are supposed to conduct themselves. There's a way that deacons are supposed to conduct themselves. Husbands and wives are to conduct themselves in the house of God. So keep that in mind. This is the thesis of the whole book of 1 Timothy. Amen. And so now Timothy is saying, okay, as men, here's how you conduct yourself in the house of God. Notice what it says in verse number 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That word there, will, 
It means to will something deliberately, to Man. have a purpose. Man. And so Paul is saying, look, here is the purpose of what this is all about. How are you supposed to behave yourself in the house of God? Here's how. Men are to lift up holy hands. Amen. Now this word man or men here in this text is the word aner, mm -hmm. which is males. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, we also have the same word there again. Mm -hmm. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That word men there is the word anthropos. Mm -hmm. And so now we're dealing with mankind in general. Amen. So who does God want to be saved? He wants men to be saved Amen. and he wants women to be saved. Amen. But when we come to verse number eight, he tells us that men, males, are to lift up holy hands everywhere in prayer. Mm -hmm. And so what is he talking about everywhere? Mm -hmm. Is he talking about when I go to the bathroom, when I go to bed, when I go here, when I go there? Mm -hmm. Remember the thesis of 1 Timothy, learning how to behave ourselves in the house of God. And so what is he dealing with everywhere? He's talking about in every church. Mm -hmm. Because all you have to do is go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Paul said he was going to send Timothy into Corinth. And he said that Timothy that Paul preached the same thing everywhere in every church. And so this is not a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. You know, some people say, well, Paul is just speaking here culturally. Mm -hmm. Paul is just saying this is for the people that was written during this time. This was taught everywhere. Amen. And so what is Paul saying? Paul is saying men you are in leadership. Mm -hmm. Notice we've got a distinction here. Men. Men are to lead. Notice it is the purpose, it is the will, it is the desire of Paul that this happens. Now, why would Paul say that this was his desire? Go up to verse number seven. And notice this is not just a mere man that's talking. This is a man who had been appointed as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. And notice this. I speak my opinion in Christ. He said, I speak the truth in Christ. And I lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in verity. And since I am an apostle, since I am inspired, since I received my revelation from Jesus Christ, I can tell you what your role is as a man in the local church. Mm -hmm. Then Paul comes down to verse number seven, or verse number nine, in like manner, mm -hmm. just like it was a deliberate will or deliberate purpose for the man to lead, now it is a deliberate will and a deliberate purpose for the women to do the following. Notice what he says. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel mm -hmm. with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Verse 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And so when we talk about the role and work of women in the Lord's church, Part of her role and part of her work is how she adorns herself. Amen. That word adorn there means to ornament. Think about at Christmas time. What do you put on your Christmas trees? Mm -hmm. You put on ornaments. Why do you put an ornament on a Christmas tree? Because you want your Christmas tree to look nice. You ornament your house with light. Why? Because you want your house to look nice. Mm -hmm. And so Paul is saying here, part of her role is to make sure the, that she ornaments the outside of Man. her body. Man. And how is she supposed to do this? Notice he says, in modest apparel. Man. I love that word modest. It comes from uh, the Greek word kosmio. Mm. You hear the word cosmos. And when you think about the cosmos, mm -hmm. who created the cosmos? Amen. God. 
And when God finished the cosmos, and when God finished everything that he created, he said, behold, it is very good. Amen. Sisters, when you ornament yourselves mm -hmm. and you stand in front of the mirror, you ought to be able to say, behold, it is very good yeah. <laughs> in the way that you dress. Amen. You see, when we talk about this modest apparel, that word modest there means to be well arranged, to be seemly. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about dress that's going to cover you. Mm -hmm. We're not going to talk about every, everything hanging out. People see things that they don't need to see. Mm -hmm. When we think about this word, and I, I need, well, I better stay in front of the camera so the people in the camera can see me. If you got to do this, <laughs> if you got to do this, <laughs> and if you sit down and got to do that, or if you got to do this, you're not modest. Mm -hmm. Man. That's not modesty. But how many times do we dress that way and then get upset when somebody looks at you. Mm -hmm. You see, we're talking about modest Amen. apparel. Amen. It has to be good in the sight of God. Amen. But notice what else he says. Modest apparel with shame facedness. This word there means to dress with a sense of shame. Reverence and regard. Notice this. To self and others. Amen. You see, sometimes sisters will come out, and we're talking about sisters in the church. They will come out, and they'll say, well, the brothers shouldn't be looking. Well, they shouldn't be looking. But remember, when you dress, you have to dress in regard for yourself mm -hmm. and regard for others. Amen. And so you need to look in the mirror and say, am I covered? Am I modest? Am I good in the sight of God? Amen. But then notice what else he says. And sobriety. Dressing with the sense. And this word sobriety, it has a couple different meanings. In one passage, when we're talking about the elders, it uses that same word. It means to, to have self-control. But it also means to have a sound mind. Mm -hmm. In other words, what Paul is saying, dress sisters like you got some sense. Mm -hmm. Dress like you know God's word. Amen. Dress like you know what is good in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. It is not about the current fad. It's not about what the current color is. It's about what God has said in his word. Mm -hmm. So part of your role as a sister in the church, and remember 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15, how we ought to behave ourselves in the house of God, there is a way that you are to behave yourself in your dress. Amen. Somebody needs to teach this. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't teach it, we're going to have a generation that grows up and they don't know how to dress and please God. It's interesting when you read Genesis chapter 3. You know, we're talking about modest dress and we're talking about roles here. We've already established in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8, that men are to be in leadership. Men are to be out front everywhere, as it says. Then we have women here who are supposed to adorn themselves in proper apparel. Husbands, faithful husbands. Remember yesterday we were talking about spiritual power couples. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a spiritual power couple, you see your wife in something that's immodest, don't let her out the house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not saying cage her up. <laughs> but as a husband, you need to be able to say, baby, you might not want to wear that mm -hmm. because it's kind of revealing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can be nice, sweetheart. That looks a little short. You know, that might be a, a distraction to the brother. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting when you come to Genesis chapter 3 that as Eve is having a conversation with the serpent, where is Adam? The Bible says that Adam was with her. How many times have, as men, we have seen our wives, we've seen our daughters in immodest dress, and we haven't said a word. Now, it's interesting in Genesis chapter 3, 
when the Lord came looking, when the Lord came down and was walking in, they were walking in the cool of the day. Who was it that the Lord came looking after? Mm -hmm. He said, Adam, where art thou? Uh -huh. Aren't we in leadership, man? Aren't you the head of your house? Man. Aren't you supposed to be the head of your yeah. house? And if she's coming out and she's not dressed with sobriety, shamefacedness, and in modest apparel, shouldn't you say something as the husband Amen. to tell her that she needs to dress in alignment with God's word? Because we're going to the house of God. Amen. And there is a way that we need to behave ourselves Amen. in the house of God. Amen. But notice what else he says in verse 10. He says, but that, or let me finish uh, verse 9. And sobriety with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now he's going to talk about, here's some things that you don't need to do. As you're dressing, as you're adorning yourself, here's the way you adorn yourself. But then here's some ways that you should not adorn yourself. You know, it's not about the broidered hair. And he's talking about hair that's twisted. Hair that's interweaved together. And so is Paul saying it's wrong to plait our hair? No, he's not saying that. But he's saying there's something more important than the outward appearance. Mm -hmm. It's the inward appearance yeah. that needs to be taken care of. Yeah. But then notice he talks about the gold and the ornaments and the pearls and the costly array. Did you know that some people come to the house of God to be seen? Mm -hmm. You see, it's not about you being... Who cares what kind of shoes you wear? Who cares if they're red bottoms? <laughs> but why are you wearing it? Because I want people to see how much money I got. <laughs> I want people to see my body. I want people to see what I look like. Well, that's not why you come to the house of God. We come to the house of God. It's already been established by all of our speakers here. The aim in worship is God and not your clothes. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 3, starting in verse number 16. I hear a lot of sisters say, you know, it, it really doesn't matter what we wear because, you know, it, it's my body. I can do what I want. And they'll even say, my husband likes it. If your husband likes it, wear it in the house. Mm -hmm. Not in the house of God. <laughs> you can't wear that in the house of God if it's immodest. Man. <laughs> and so if your husband likes it, wear it at home. Man. But I want you to notice how important dress is. You know, as we read through the books of uh, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, you know, we see how the, the kingdom was united. Then we see how the kingdom was divided. We see that Israel went into Assyrian captivity. Then Judah went into Babylonian captivity. And all throughout the scriptures, it gives us reasons why they went into captivity. There was idolatry. You know, there was shedding of innocent blood. All kinds of things was happening. But I want you to notice what Isaiah focuses on here in Isaiah chapter 3. Why was Judah going to go into Babylonian captivity? Let's get a glimpse of what was happening in Jerusalem. Verse 16, moreover the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion mm -hmm. are haughty and walk, with, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. That word wanton there means to be flirtatious and to, have, and to uh, draw a sexual attraction. And so how was they walking? <laughs> because they wanted people to see them. Mm -hmm. Now watch what the Bible says. Walking with mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will smite a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. And when he talked about the round tires, he's talking about a round pendant. What's he talking about? Being ornamented with so many things. Mm. Then he says the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets, the ornaments of the legs, the headbands, the tablets, the earrings, the rings, the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the mantles and the whipples and the crisping pans, the glasses, the fine linen, and the hoods and the veils. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink, and instead of a girdle, a rent. 
and instead of a well set hair, baldness, and instead of a stomacher, a, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword. Why are the men going to fall by the sword? Because look how the ladies are acting. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the mighty in the war. And what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem? And her gates shall lament and mourn. And she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Mm -hmm. Think of the house of God today. The Jerusalem of today. What do our sisters look like in the Jerusalem of the day? What is it that we find when it comes to their dress and what they wear and how they carry themselves? Did you know that the church can and will suffer by the way that sisters dress? Amen. Because it's part of their role. Part of their role is to make sure that they are adorned in the right way. Amen. But then watch what he says in verse 10. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Her inward adorning befits a woman who is professing godliness in her life and professing good works. In other words, her outside is going to match her inside. If her inside is godly, if her inside is holy, her dress is going to be godly Amen. and it's going to be holy. Amen. And what else you're going to find, she's going to be involved with good works. Amen. So there's part one. Part of her role in the church is to make sure she's adorned properly. Amen. But then number two, part of her role is to make sure that she learns properly. Notice verses 11 and 12. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. That word learn there means to increase in your knowledge. And so notice what's happening here. The woman, part of her role is to make sure that she knows the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about that Titus 2 woman. That woman can't be a Titus 2 woman if she doesn't know the Bible. Right. And so here she's learning. But notice there's a way in which she's learning. She's learning in silence. Now that word silence there doesn't mean to not say anything. Because we know that everyone is commanded to say in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 19 and 20. Mm -hmm. But he's talking about an attitude in your learning. You learn in quietness. Thayer says this word means one who stays at home doing his own work and doesn't meddle in the affairs of others. And so she has a, an attitude of quiet. She's not taking over the Bible class. She's not, some sisters will take over the Bible class and try and teach the Bible class from their seat. That's not learning in quietness. Amen. But then watch what he says. Not only in quietness, but also in subjection, in obedience and subordination. Obedience to who? Number one, obedience to God. Amen. Because remember, this was not just Paul saying, this was the saying of God. And so she's to learn in obedience to God, but then also in obedience or in subjection to the one who's teaching. So she has to listen quietly. Can she ask questions? Certainly she can ask questions. Can she make comments in class? Certainly she can make comments in class. Amen. But she cannot take over Amen. the class. Amen. She's learning in silence. Amen. It's part of her role. And then we come to verse 12. He says, but I suffer or I permit not a woman to teach. This word teach means to hold a discourse with others in order to instruct them. So can a woman teach? Yes, she can teach because we know from Titus chapter 2 that she's to teach other women. Amen. But remember what we're dealing with in the context here. We're dealing with when men are present. There's a way you to behave in the house of God. Amen. Then he says, nor to usurp authority over the man. That means to exercise dominion over. Again, remember the context. We're talking about in the house of God, she cannot take something that does not belong to her. Amen. 
And let me say this to the men. You cannot give her authority that you don't have. Amen. Amen. How is it, can you, you walk up to a sister and say, well, sister, I need you to lead a prayer. Mm -hmm. And the sister get up and say, well, brother so-and-so asked me and told me to lead a prayer. Wow. Mm -hmm. you, didn't, you don't have the authority Amen. to give her that authority. Amen. Amen. Sisters, don't let a man cause you to get out of your role. Amen. It can be a preacher. It can be an elder. It can be a deacon. It can be your husband. If he tells you to do something that God did not tell you to do, don't you do it. Amen. Because not only will you get out of your role, he'll be out of his role, and both of you are in sin. Amen. And somebody's got to teach this. Amen. But people, oh, this is too controversial in the church. No, it's not. It's the truth of God's word. Mm -hmm. We need to tell people what the Bible says. Amen. So that our churches can be strong. But then now Paul says, look, here is why all of this is supposed to happen. Notice verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. That word formed to be molded. We're talking about one who is a, a potter. And God is the potter. And what he did, he molded Adam first. And so when you think about these roles, this is how we know this is not a cultural thing. Every time. God deals with the roles of women, and every time he deals with marriage, he always goes back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. So what does Paul do here? He went back to the beginning. You're going to find out tomorrow, I've got another tough subject, marriage, divorce, remarriage. Mm -hmm. You're going to notice that Jesus also went back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. You see, he said, this is the way it was. This is how God set it up. And so when we talk about her role in adorning, God set that up. The church didn't. When we talk about her role in learning, God set that up. The church did not set it up. Amen. This is God's way. And if we're going to be pleasing to God, we have to do it the way God said it. Amen. Notice verse 14. Here's the second reason. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So does this mean that the woman is inferior to the man? No, it doesn't mean that. God is just saying she was the one that was beguiled by Satan. But isn't it interesting, as we already observed, where was Adam when she was beguiled? He was right there with her. How come he didn't take the leadership and pull her? Look, baby, we need, we need to get away from this truth. I, I don't know who this serpent is, but let's go. But she's standing there having a conversation with the serpent, and Adam's just standing there with his hands behind his back. <laughs> And how many of us do that in the church? All kinds of stuff going on in our church and we stand like this. Mm -hmm. Women leading, women leading prayer, women preaching, they're taking over the Bible class, mm -hmm. they're doing stuff they're not supposed to and the manager's like this. Mm -hmm. Man. God's coming for us. Man. He's coming for you. We better do it the way the Bible says. Amen. And, and brothers, why are we afraid of the sisters? Amen. Wow. Amen. Why, why are we afraid of the sisters? Amen. Well, sister so-and-so was gone. Well, sister so-and-so said, well, sister, why are you afraid of the sisters? Man. Because we have no respect for God. That's why. You see, we've got to get back to the book. Amen. Yes, they, they may be the backbone of the congregation. They may do a lot of work, but they can't get out of order. No. Just like anything else can't get out of order. And so let's just get back to the book and do what God said. And so notice... Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now notice verse number 15. Notwithstanding, even though she was formed second, even though she was the one that was deceived, mm -hmm. there's still hope for her. Mm -hmm. And what is that hope? Number one, she's got to stay in her room. She's got to dress right. She's got to learn right. And then watch what he says. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. So does that mean that in order for a woman to be saved and to fulfill her role, she has to have children? No, she doesn't. Because all women can't have children. So sometimes when we read a verse, if we can understand what it doesn't mean, it can help us understand what it does mean. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that she has to have babies. Doesn't mean she has to go adopt children so that she can have children. No, it doesn't mean that. What Paul is trying to get the church here to see is there are differing roles 
in the Lord's church. Amen. Here, men are out in leadership, working in the forefront. Mm -hmm. Women are in the background, working in a nurturing type of role, where she is not in leadership. That's all he's saying there in verse 15. But watch how she's supposed to do it. She shall be saved in childbearing if she continues in faith. Romans 10, 17, how does faith come? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how is she fulfilling her role? She's fulfilling her role according to the word of God. Amen. But then he says also in charity or in love. So what's her motivation to dress right? What's her motivation to learn right? Love. What's our motivation to do all of God's will? Love. So she has to do this in love. But then watch what he says. In holiness. Why in holiness? Because who and what is our God? Be ye holy for I am holy. And notice how holiness is connected to dressing. Holiness is connected to learning. That's part of her role Amen. in the church. And then he says, in sobriety. Again, the same word, self-control and soundness of mind. She's to do this in a way that's in self-control and she has a right mind. How do we get a right mind? By going to the right doctrine. Notice how her role is so important. Now, quickly, how much time do I have left? Four minutes. All right, four minutes. Let's look at some practical ways Women can fulfill their role in the local church. Number one, I didn't put my glasses on because I can't see. <laughs> Support your husband and your family. Colossians Man. chapter 3 and verse 18. Man. You know, she is to submit to him. He is to love her. One of the greatest ways that she can fulfill her role in the church is to make sure that her husband is supported and her family is supported. Amen. Then number next, teach other women the Bible. Titus chapter 2. But here's the thing. You can't teach somebody else the Bible if you don't know Amen. the Bible. It's interesting. One time, me and my wife and I were, we were doing, I think it was a family seminar somewhere. We had a, a class where we were all together. I taught that class. Then the men and the ladies separated. The men went to one place. The ladies stayed in the auditorium. And then whoever introduced my wife, she got up and said, now that the men are gone, we can let our hair down and cut loose. And my wife got up and she said, there will be no cutting loose. We're opening the Bible. So grab your Bibles and let's study God's word. Amen. Where, where did this come from where we can cut loose and do this because the men are, you know, sisters, if you're going to stand and teach God's word, you better teach the Bible. Amen. You better be prepared to teach God's word. This, this, is not, this is not a fly, fly by night thing. This is not what you think and what you feel. This is what the Bible says. Right. You want to be a Titus 2 woman, you're going to have to learn the Bible. And you're going to have to teach younger women the Bible so that they can grow to be uh, Titus 2 women. Be a partner with your husband in the gospel. We talked about Aquila and Priscilla yesterday. You know, they come into Corinth, they were dispelled from Rome, and they meet up with Paul, and what were they doing together? Teaching and preaching the gospel. Later on in that same chapter, we find that Priscilla and Aquila pull Apollos aside and teach him the way more perfectly. Amen. Wouldn't that be beautiful if we had more husbands and wives working together for the cause of Jesus Christ? Amen. Be a soul winner. Matthew chapter 16, or, Mark, or Romans chapter 16, verse 6. It said of Mary there that she bestowed much labor on Paul and the other apostles. There is something women can do in the Lord's church. Amen. Labor in the Lord, Romans chapter 16, verse 12. Support the gospel, Luke chapter 8, verses 3. We find that those ladies there, when Jesus was here on earth, it said they ministered unto him from their substance. You can financially support the gospel. You can support the gospel in your participation. There are so many things that ladies can do in the Lord's church. Increase your learning. We've already established in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11. She's to learn in a certain way. Ladies, you should be learning God's word, hiding God's word in your heart so you can help your husband, you can help your family, you can help young sisters in the Lord's church. Amen. Then next, 
Examine the life of the widows who were qualified to be included in the number of support in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 10. See some of the things that they did, how they washed the saints' feet, how they were involved in good works, and how they did all of these things. These are things that our sisters can do in the Lord's kingdom. Amen. Develop into a Titus 2 woman. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that this woman develops into the Titus 2 woman? Shouldn't she be receiving encouragement from her husband Amen. so that she can become a Titus 2 woman? Amen. And isn't it interesting when you go to Titus chapter 2, Titus, the evangelist, was to speak sound doctrine. And he was to speak that sound doctrine to the aged men, and he was to speak that sound doctrine to the aged women, so that the aged women could then teach the younger women. In our local congregations, our evangelists, our preachers ought to be teaching the older ladies how to teach the younger ladies. Mm -hmm. But who better to get that information from than from a person who knows the scripture? Mm -hmm. But yet, usually here's what happens. We have a lady that doesn't know anything who's teaching other ladies and teaching them don't, how, to, how not to know nothing. And then they're teaching people how not to know nothing. Mm -hmm. Now we've got to get back to the Bible. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know, when we think about the work of, of the evangelist, man, we've got a lot of instruction and a lot of teaching to do in our local churches. Mm -hmm. Help your husband qualify for leadership. Amen. Man, if there's one thing that we're lacking in many of our churches, we can't find qualified men to be elders Amen. and deacons. Amen. Man, why, you can help your husband. You can help him build that character. You can help him rule his house well. You can help him do all of those things. And we find those qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3 and Titus chapter 1. You can help him to become the man that he needs to be. Quickly, some objections. Well, what about the role of the woman in the church? Some people say, well, what about Phoebe? You know, Phoebe was a servant of the Lord. And people say, well, she was a deaconess. Well, being a servant doesn't mean that you're a leader. Mm -hmm. But I want, I want to notice some, more, some words that's found there in Romans chapter 16. First, if Phoebe was a deaconess, where are the qualifications? Aren't there qualifications for a deacon? Mm -hmm. Aren't there qualifications for an elder in the Lord's church? But where are the qualifications for a deaconess? So do we just make them up? And so if we want a person to be a deaconess, she can become one? So we know that she wasn't, this wasn't an office. The word means a woman to whom care of either poor or sick woman, women was entrusted. Mm -hmm. She may have been going to Corinth to help individuals who were sick. She may have been going to do some visits. She may have been going to do some cooking or whatever. We don't know what she was doing there, but Paul says whatever she's doing, assist her in this business. Amen. Amen. She was a succorer of many. That word sucker means to care for or come to the aid of and provide resources for. So this was not a, a role of leadership here. Amen. Because it just wouldn't make sense. Because if Paul just wrote, if Paul said this in 1 Timothy, then why would he say, okay, let this lady come into Corinth and be a leader? Then Paul would be contradicting himself. But then not only would Paul be contradicting himself, remember where Paul got his information from in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He said he received it from Jesus Christ, which means Jesus was contradicting himself. But we know that's not the case. Amen. So Phoebe was not a leader in the Lord's church. Amen. So what's the conclusion? Our sister's role in the Lord's church is a role of nurturing and not a role of leadership. She is not to be out front. She cannot take authority over the man and she cannot be given authority to be over the man. Amen. Scripture does not give her the authority to lead over other women either. Where do we find that in Scripture? Mm -hmm. Now I've been in several congregations and, and people have talked to me and said, when, when is your wife going to take over the ladies? <laughs> <laughs> My wife doesn't take over the ladies. Because the ladies are under the oversight of the elders, Amen. just like everybody else. Amen. And so if you have a group of ladies, and you have a lady that's over that group, she's setting direction, she's doing this, she's doing that, that's the man's job. The elders ought to be setting direction on what the church ought to be doing. Amen. But how many times do men get surprised 
on what ladies are doing, like in ladies' days and ladies' classes. Sometimes elders have no idea Amen. that ladies are in classrooms not even teaching the Bible. Amen. Because they give them the authority to say, okay, this is your class. You teach what you want. Mm -hmm. Guess what you're opening up? You're opening up Pandora's box. What if she's teaching false doctrine? Mm -hmm. Because I guarantee you the elders are not going into that class and sitting in the class to see what she's teaching. Man. How do they know? And I guarantee you every lady that comes out of the class say, oh, that was a good class. <laughs> and you know why they say it was a good class? Because the Bible wasn't taught. They don't want to talk about the Bible. Mm -hmm. You see, she, she's not over the other ladies. The elders are over every program Amen. in the local church. Amen. Not the ladies. Amen. Then sisters, your salvation depends upon you fulfilling your role. Amen. Notice she shall be saved in childbearing. In other words, if she fulfills her God-given role, she's going to be where? In heaven. But if she doesn't fulfill her God-given role, where is she going to be? Mm -hmm. In hell. But it's sad to say that if some of the sisters are in hell, some of the brothers are going to be tagging along with her. Mm -hmm. Because who allowed it? Man. Who didn't say anything about it? Mm -hmm. Who didn't speak up? Who didn't lead? Who didn't instruct? Who wasn't the head of their home? Who did God come looking for? He came looking for Adam, mm -hmm. even though she was deceived. Mm -hmm. You see, ladies, you, you have an important role in the Lord's church. Amen. Your adorning is important. Amen. Your learning is important. Amen. And you understanding and knowing your role is important. And may God give you the courage and the strength and the self-control and the sobriety to do what he said and not what everybody else is Amen. doing. Amen. Amen.